Hello and welcome to Made in Siberia. In this video I'm going to talk about three most common causes of radiated emissions failures during EMC compliance testing. We're gonna go over in detail for each case and I'll show you some practical examples. If you're just starting out making PCB layouts, this is the right video for you. As always, I timestamp this video, so feel free to jump ahead sections if you're already familiar with them. First of all, let's talk a bit about EMC. Electromagnetic compatibility is a measurement of emissions coming off a product that can cause interference to another product. This is something that every product has to go through before it gets released in the market. And previously I made a video dedicated to this subject which you can watch in full here. But to summarize it, EMC consists of radiated emissions testing which is performed in an anechoic chamber, conducted emissions testing which is performed through a line impedance stabilization network and electrostatic discharge which is performed with ESD gun. Each test will have limits that are specified in international standards which will vary depending depending on the country and also application industry for the product. But the good PCB design practices are always the same. So now that we know why we need to do it, let's dig into it and show you some practical examples. Number one in my list is splitting planes or not having them at all. And this is the most common mistake you will see engineers do in the industry. To be clear, it's not the planes that cause the issue, but the tracks that cross planes without any adjacent plane to them and therefore the return current has no choice but to blast off the PCB and dissipate into free air. We don't want that, but let's start from the beginning. The main reason for this mistake is that in a conventional theory you learn that the current follows a path of lowest resistance and that the return trace of the same cross-sectional area as your line conductor is sufficient for good grounding. But this is only true for low-speed circuits such as audio or temperature readings. While for high frequency this is no longer true, and high frequency signals follow the path of lowest inductance, not resistance. And to provide the path of lowest inductance, the designer must add a solid plane under the trace, which will provide a reference plane for the trace and will sync all the current. Take a look at the screenshot from the paper presented here and just notice how the current flow changes with the frequency of the signal. I will provide a link in the description to the full paper so you can read it. So when you do your PCB layout, a JSON layer must be really as close as possible as the signal layer. Usually I put it 4 millimeters apart and uh, I follow the stack signal, plane, signal, plane, and so on. When dealing with high frequencies, a full layer PCB stack is typically assumed. And notice that I keep saying planes and not ground planes, that is because power planes work too. As long as it is solid and it provides a uniform reference for the whole trace end to end, this is good enough. Sometimes you may want to stitch power plane to ground plane with so-called stitching capacitors. Read more about it in the internet. And another tip, you should always look out for wires breaking your PCB plane and uh, making it less solid. This is something that can happen to an experienced designer as well, because this is something you're not always paying attention to. So make sure to check your plane before you send your PCB for production. So let's take a look at a quick example. Here I've got USB traces coming into the microcontroller located on the top layer. And on the mid layer 1 you've got 0 volt reference plane. And on the mid layer 2 you've got power planes. And uh, one is for core voltage and the other for 3 volt 3. Then on the bottom Bottom layer, I've got other traces. Let's hover over this particular one right here. This is a clock trace, and if we take a look at the mid layer 2, which is a reference plane for this, even though it's a power plane, we can see that this trace is crossing planes, and this is going to cause an EMC failure because basically it will lift the current into the air. So, what we've got to do, we have to route this trace with a consideration to the power plane underneath it, and uh, just like that, now you can see that this trace does not cross any planes anymore, and it has a continuous reference plane underneath it. The second most common mistake is not considering fast rising clock edges. This is very typical and it can happen unexpectedly, even on a board that has passed EMC before. The integrated circuit can change with a short notice from a manufacturer, but if you follow the design practices 
that I show you, then you wouldn't have to worry about that. So the best way to deal with this issue is to have some serious resistance. Some ICs will already have buffer output resistance, so you should check the data sheet. But in general, I would put 33 ohm resistance on every output unless it's jitter sensitive. And I will come back to it in a minute. The serious resistor sets the characteristic impedance for the signal output. Notice that it is different to termination resistor, which sets characteristic impedance for the signal input. And depending on the length of the trace, both can be required. To show you a bad example, this is a radiated emissions failure, which was easily fixed by fitting series resistance on SPI bus. Having said all that, sometimes series resistance is just not appropriate for the circuit, as it cannot jitter to the trace. And this is especially the case for the master clock on ADDA converters. And what you want to do there is to have termination resistance only. There are different ways of adding termination resistors, and you should look it up as well. But in short, you can either have a 50 ohm resistor to ground, or you can have a pair of 100 ohm resistors, one connected to power supply and the other connected to ground, and in the middle you will have your trace. Effectively, this will create a 50 ohm characteristic impedance, which is a standard value for most circuits. Being consistent with termination of clock signals and impedance matching is really important, and you should get in the habit of checking the current direction and finding out where is the input and where is the output and sticking resistors in there. This will also help you to debug the circuit later as well, because otherwise how are you gonna do it? If a signal is coming off one BGA into another BGA and is located on a mid Middle layer, then you have no access to it whatsoever. Therefore, just sticking some resistors there will help you massively if you need to debug the circuit, even if they end up being zero ohm links. But before I continue to another engineering reason for EMC failures, this one's a bit softer. Overworking and being tired is another common mistake that happens to a lot of people. When people try to do too many things at once, they begin to make simple mistakes that could have been easily avoided. So remember, taking care of your body is just as important as taking care of your mind. And with that in mind, let's change the scene a little bit. Hey, welcome. I think climbing is a very natural profession for an engineer because like engineering, climbing is all about solving problems. And when I feel a bit stuck, I tend to come climb. This is a climbing gym called The Hang. It's based in Hounslow in London. So let's get on with it. Last climbs, it's been good session. A bit tired after a while of no climbing, and my arms are definitely sore. But it was good fun, always good fun. Yeah. Now I'm back and let's finish the list. Something that is very little understood by PCB designers and that causes a lot of EMC failures as well, is a mechanical design or the enclosure. You are probably familiar with something called Faraday cage and you know that this is something you always want to replicate with your enclosure. But to be really effective, a Faraday cage must be completely encapsulating the source of emissions. But if it has little gaps there and there, the signal will leak. And this is something that telecommunication engineers have exploited for quite a while. The leaky feeder cable has gaps in its outer shield which allow the radio signal to radiate through them along the length of the entire cable. This technique is used for Wi-Fi extension in London Underground and in London Eye. So this highlights the importance of 360 degrees shielding because if you don't have that or if you have gaps then your signals will radiate everywhere. And this is actually something that happens all the time when people buy cheap Chinese USB or HDMI cables. And in fact, almost any USB cable you buy online on Alibaba or wherever will have this problem. But it's not a problem for cable manufacturer. It is a problem for product designer. Because when you ship your product, you have to ship it with a cable and you have to ship it with a cable that passes EMC. That is because when FCC or any other regulatory body will take your product for a test, they will use it as is. They will use it with all the cables that come in the box. So if your USB cable does not have 360 degrees shielding and instead is terminated with a pigtail or something similar, then you will have results like this one. So what do you do to prevent this? Well, the first thing you can do, you can check the datasheet of the cable. When you contact the manufacturer, you ask them for a datasheet and you take 
take a look at it. Of course, you should not rely just on a data sheet, especially if it's written in Chinese. So what you have to do is to open up a cable and look up for yourself how it's actually made. And for the purpose of this video, we're going to do exactly that. So as you can see this cheap USB cable does not have a shield at all. And here's how it compares to other cables with good 360 degrees shielding. Back here, as I started talking about the enclosures, the other important thing to consider is paint. You will typically have paint inside of the product and it can prevent Faraday cage from happening because if you have paint on both sides of the enclosure unit, then the surface is not going to be conductive. So to give you an example, I've got here an audio interface by Audion called Sono, which is a guitar preamplifier with an audio interface designed for guitar players. And uh, let's imagine that we've got a proper USB cable connected with good 360 degree shielding. Now I know that this particular one is a complete joke, but let's just imagine that. And uh, we're gonna take a look inside the unit and see what can possibly be wrong uh, this metalwork and uh, what sort of tips and advice I can give you. So let's take a look inside. Now the first thing we notice is that it has paint inside the unit and uh, on the sides in particular it's not continuous but we're gonna take a multimeter and just check continuity. So we can see that uh, obviously it's not a very good connection where the paint has been applied and uh, this is something you wanna get rid of, uh, especially at the points where it makes contact with the other piece of the chassis. So you just want to remove this paint. And the other thing you do is you apply the gasket. So this gasket here is a continuous strip and uh, you just want to make sure that it's actually conductive. And the other thing you have to check is you have to check on the other side because the glue that the manufacturer applies may or may not be conductive and you really need to check for that too. So make sure that it actually beeps. And basically that's about it. Another interesting question is can I create Faraday cage on a product that is not made of metal? For example if it's made of plastic. Well actually I don't know the answer to this question so have a think about it. Personally I found that the conductive paint works best and this is basically the kind of metallized paint that provides a uniform surface inside of the unit and this acts like a Faraday cage. I tried using it on a product once and it was giving good results but it was bloody expensive. So let me know your thoughts on this and if you had similar experience. I hope this video made sense and that you learned something new and together we can uh, reduce the amount of FR4 material wasted by electronics industry every year. Feel free to message me on any social platform and let me know your thoughts on the video and what you found most interesting and what else would you like me to cover. That's it for now, like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.